All right, folks, so if you've made it this far, what that means is that you have watched, hopefully, the laboratory videos at this point that we've done together on the pH change or effect on a food preservative. And that food preservative was sodium benzoate that we used. So I referenced maybe a couple of times about the grade sheet. Uh, things that you're going to have to write in your laboratory notebook throughout this process. And the grade sheet has been made available to you as long as you have completed the previous pre-laboratory work leading into this section. All right. So when you pull up the grade sheet, this is what it's going to look like. So the reason that I do this is, especially in the very beginning, or maybe with the first class that you have with me that is laboratory entry based, is I like to give you a template to go by. What are some of the things that I'm looking for? What are some of the things that are very commonly put into a laboratory notebook? Because I don't want you to go into this blindly. So your laboratory notebook needs to be divided up into a couple of sections. All right, so I need to kind of give you some rules, at least in the very beginning. Uh, number one, you're always going to write in pen every single time you write in pen. And it has to be blue or black ink. Never red, never orange, never pink, never purple, never any other color of the rainbow except black or um, blue. That is it, folks. That's it. No other choices. No other colors are out there. One of the reasons is because black and blue ink show up very well. They are very dark colors. There's no pigmentation in them. It's not going to fade as easy as some of the other colors might. And that's very important for a laboratory notebook because a lab notebook is a legal document. And that laboratory notebook has to be held with a company maybe for years and years and years later down the road. And if you ever work for a lab company, your laboratory notebook is actually the property of the company. It is not the property of you. So that might be surprising for you, but if you ever leave the company and go and work somewhere else, they will actually keep every entry, every lab notebook that you manage, that you wrote in and so forth throughout the time that you were working with them. So pen is a have to and blue or black is a have to. Why not pencil? Well, pencil can be erased and that's the problem with a laboratory notebook. Once an entry goes in, you have to keep it there. You cannot erase it, you can mark it out, you can initial it, but you have to keep your mistakes that are still legible, by the way, inside of the notebook. All right, so all of this will get addressed in a different section of the laboratory folder, and you're gonna see some laboratory rules that I want you to go by as far as making entries into a notebook. This video is going to focus on just a grade sheet and that's it. All right, so as you're writing these statements in, you have to make sure that you're writing these statements in pen and that is blue or black. All right, so your very first section of the laboratory notebook needs to be a purpose. So this has to be titled up here at the above. You see that. And I need you to write three statements into that purpose section. It should be very brief. It should be very short. To monitor the effect of pH change on sodium benzoate, to determine if a new substance forms, and to determine an unknown by a density measurement. This is why, folks. Why are you doing the lab experiment that we wanted you to do? It should be very brief. It should be very short. I don't need any fat. You need to trim it down. And I only need these three statements in that purpose. Okay. Most of the time you write in full sentences, but quite honestly, I don't really even care. As long as these three are addressed, you get two points, you get two points, and you get two points there. Look, I'm telling you how many points you're going to get two. So these should be easy 100s for you as long as you follow the grade sheet. All right, next will come a background section. 
This is typically found in academic labs. It's not found in actual real laboratory settings. The purpose really isn't found in real laboratory settings either. But a background section is a typical thing that academic institutions require of you. Uh, this forces you to go back. It forces you to dig up some theory. It forces you to draw some structures and reactions and so forth, and that's why we do it. So the background section should always include structures and reactions, and that's what you're seeing up here in the very top. Structure of sodium benzoate, structure of benzoic acid, the reaction of benzoic acid and sodium benzoate, all of this can be found in your laboratory scan with your procedure on it. It's all right there up front and personal for you. So the only thing you have to do is just transfer that over. The mechanism of the reaction to form benzoic acid. This is stuff that we typically address in the pre-laboratory experiment or the pre-laboratory lecture videos at least. So that's where you're going to find that information. All of the structures that are the possibilities for the density part B of the lab experiment. Heptane, 2-propanol, ethyl acetate, I spelt that wrong by the way, ethanol, chlorobenzene, and bromobenzene. All of those are possibilities. I need the structures of each one, and I also need what we call physical data of each one. Well, what do I write down with physical data? I mean, there's so much stuff that could actually be there. What on earth are we talking about? Well, physical data for sodium benzoate and benzoic acid, really the only thing that we were looking at here was melting point. And that's really the only physical data that I need to report. I mean, why do I need solubility? Why do I need uh, any other characteristic or attribute toward these reagents and compounds if I'm not going to actually use it in the lab. It's just wasted space and it's wasted time, so leave it out. The only thing that we did with those was melting points. That's it. So only include the melting points. That's all. Uh, physical data for the heptane, 2-propanol, ethyl acetate, ethanol, chlorobenzene, bromobenzene, all of these were your unknown possibilities for the density section. Okay, well, what physical characteristics did we use in that section? It was just density, folks. That was it. So why do you want to write me a paragraph on every single one of them when the only thing that we did here was density? So you simply just need to look up the density values of these, and that is all. And this, satisfy, this satisfies the physical data entries for each one of these compounds. So again, I don't want your wrist to be hurting by the time this is over. I don't want your fingers to get a cramp, right? I don't want this process to take hours. If it is, then you're writing too much. And on top of that, I don't even require full sentences from you. Just short abbreviated statements is going to be good enough, especially for the next part, which is the procedure. So if you scroll through and take a look at the procedure, again, I'm telling you all of the have tos that you have to put in. And if you go back and you watch those uh, videos of the labs that we did together with all of the data and the observations that are included in those pictures, that is why I did those presentations. That's why I gave you the pictures. That's why I gave you the video so you can actually see some of these steps that are going on. So these are statements that I want to write into the laboratory notebook. It says obtain two grams of sodium benzoate. And here it says attach receipt ticket. Well, for you, because we're doing these labs maybe online, virtually, then you can't really re include a receipt ticket, can you? So you automatically get those points. There's nothing that you have to put into a lab notebook. If you were actually physically in the lab doing them, as you were weighing things out, you would print off a receipt ticket for me, and you would tape that into your lab notebook, so that way you have proof that this is what you weighed out, and it wasn't just a made up number. You know, the story here is that years and years ago, students thought they were kind of clever. And they would go in and they would just make up data and they would do the calculations based on the made up data. And then they would be like, they would never know if I did it or not. Or if I did do it and I'm kind of messed it up, I can just make up these numbers and they would never know any better. Ha 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 ha. Well, I'm on to them. So many, many years ago, I put a receipt printer on every single one of our balances. And that is why these grades 
sheets are requesting those receipt tickets. It is proof that you actually weighed out what you said you weighed out. It is part of our own quality control in especially the chemical technology program that we uh, manage. Uh, write in the actual weight, of course, what you actually weighed out, and the label information. This was the label from the sodium benzoate in the very beginning, and we talked about that as well. Uh, transfer to 30 mil beaker, measure uh, 10 mils of water, use a graduated cylinder, observations should be included. Again, all the steps that I had uh, briefly uh, presented throughout that presentation. Uh, make a three molar HCL. Use more concentrated HCL in order to do it. State the volume that you made. State how the dilution was performed. All of this was addressed in the video if you caught it. So I told you how we made the three molar. I told you how much that we made and now you know why I did that. Add five mils of acid. Use a graduated cylinder. Observations that took place. Again, you had pictures and so forth of that step and of that process that was going on. So you know what to write here. Test the pH value with paper. Report the colors and your observations. How many extra drops did you have to add? Test the pH again. Record your observations. Again, all of this was also addressed in the video. I took pictures of every one of these steps. I told you how many drops of acid that I used. It was just like you being there with me. So that's how much information that I was giving you and why I was giving it to you at that time. Uh, next, cool the solution in an ice bath. Report the temperature of the ice bath. So one of the things that you're going to see is that time is very important and temperature is very important. We always record that when we can, and in this case, there was no difference here. So the temperature of the ice bath, how long did it sit in the ice bath? Uh, how hot was the oven that I put it in? How long did we keep it in the oven? All of that is very important data that we should be writing down in a laboratory notebook whenever we can. All right. Uh, vacuum filtration, the solution, draw the apparatus. I know I'm not an artist. You probably can barely read my handwriting. I can barely read my handwriting at times, but we do like to draw. We like to put schematics into our lab notebook. We like to label pieces and parts. So that way, if someone else that might get hired with that same company later on looks at my lab notebook, they can follow it just like a lab manual, and it will tell them exactly what to do, how to do it, and how to set it up. That's the whole intention of a lab book, people. I should be able to get your lab book and give it to someone else that's never done the lab, and they should be able to follow your directions and your drawings and replicate what you did exactly without any question at all. And if you can do that, then you have written a very well lab entry into your notebook, okay? Again, attach receipt tickets. We know that we will not have any receipt tickets if we're doing this virtually. If you're on campus at any point in time with any of our classes and uh, you are doing this in our laboratory facility, then you will be printing off receipt tickets for us. Uh, however, you know, the normal Chem 151, 152s, uh, those traditionally are done in a different laboratory and you will not have receipt printers on those balances at all. Okay. Uh, observations of the crude crystals and then observations of the crystals after they dry. Both of those are very important. Again, observation-based. I want to write those down whenever I can. Uh, weight of the product after you dry it. Attach the receipt ticket. Again, we know the story with that. And then write in the weight in the notebook. So how much did that product weigh in the very end? Again, you will not have receipt tickets for that information, but we've kind of done it together, and I know what the proper weight should be. Everyone will have the same if we did do it virtually together. Okay, uh, Melting point of crystals, melting point of stock crystals, label information for the stock crystals. Again, all of that information was included in the presentation that I gave you in detail. And then notice these two line items here, a lot of people lose points on. They forget to do this, but there should be an appendix edition of the MP50. The MP50 was our melting point system, and that's very important. This melting point system will do the melting points for us over time, and it is very automated, but there's settings that we have to put in there, right? And appendix, typically people put it in the back of their lab book, but you can actually write it within your lab if that's what you want to do. And then if you ever have to use the MP50 again, 
you just refer back to that page. If you put it in the appendix, refer to the page. If you put it in your lab entry, refer back to the page. So that way, four weeks from now, if you are doing another lab and that lab uses this MP50 instrument, you do not write these directions again. The only thing that you have to say is refer to page blah for more information. That's all that you have to do. So make a good entry one time, make sure it's complete, and then use that entry over and over and over whenever you need to. So this is why sometimes people put it in the back because it's easily accessible. All of the equipment, all of that type of setting type of stuff gets kind of nestled together in the back of a lab notebook and it's just a little bit more ordered. However, I do have people, and this is not a problem, that will make these entries within their lab procedure and they remember where that's at. So later on, four, five, six weeks from now, if they need to refer to that again, they know exactly what page it's on. They can flip right to it and say, my MP50 directions are on page four. So that way we can go back and refer to those if needed. Okay. Uh, part B was the same way, provide an unknown number, uh, what's the observations of the unknown. We talked about that in the presentation. Uh, all of the weights that were taken throughout that process gets added into the lab notebook. Uh, your density graph, so you'll have to use Excel, you'll make the graph just like we kind of talked about in that particular video. You'll print that off. You should always attach that into your lab notebook and the way that you'll attach it, any kind of loose things like this, you want to tape or you want to staple the whole entire sheet, people, the whole thing in your lab notebook. So do not take a pair of scissors to anything. Scissors are bad. Okay, scissors are the devil when it comes to laboratory technique and notebook entries. Stay away from the scissors. Meaning that if you print off a sheet of paper and there's a graph with data, do not take a pair of scissors and cut around the graph and the data and only put the part of the page that was actually used. I know that sounds crazy, but anytime scissors are involved in the laboratory sciences, this could be a potential lawsuit. And the reason is because what else was on the page? What else was printed on that page that you did not want people to see and you took a pair of scissors and you cut or you made the whole page smaller? Why did you do that? I know that sounds outrageous, but there could have been data on there that maybe a company did not want a client or a regulator or an auditor to see. So whenever we do this, we always attach the entire sheet of whatever that is. So literally, if I go to Excel and I type in the number four, and that's it, and I print off that page, that whole entire page has to be stapled or taped securely in the laboratory notebook, okay? Uh, attain a density report from the density meter. Uh, make a, an appendix of the density meter, just like you did the MP50, and the directions on the density meter. Uh, folks, this whole section is going to be left out. Uh, I told you that I actually forgot to do this when I went into the lab and did it that day. So we did not do an automated density meter at all. So everyone at least will make a six on the laboratory notebook. So you don't have a zero. That's better than a zero, right? A six. I don't know how much better, but it's better. So I know that you can't make a zero on the lab assignment now, and you should feel comfort in that too, okay? Uh, calculations. What about the calculations? Well, we talked about these as well. Mass of the sodium benzoate, mass of the product, theory yield, percent yield, and then is your yield greater than 90%? That's going to be the cap here. And remember, I told you that sometimes I deliberately mess up and sometimes I do it for real. And I will always question you throughout this process. So always double check my numbers. And if something doesn't quite match, then that's okay. So just take comfort in that yet again and know that this was my data if we're doing it virtually and not your data. So you, ca I can't say that you messed up. You get to say that I messed up. All right. Uh, so I'm always double checking you. So always keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, percent error of the melting point. Was that less than 2%? And then the density formula. 
calculate the densities of those additions. That's also part of the calculations. Uh, standard deviation, we talked about that as well in that presentation video. The linear regression line, the coefficient, the R squared value, I also mentioned that in the presentation video as well. I showed you how we generated that graph. I showed you how that whole process took place. Do all three density values show standard deviation less than 0.02? And did you correctly ID the unknown based on the density value that we provided? Okay. Uh, as far as formatting goes of the lab notebook, uh, we like to see numbers at the tops of our pages, typically on the right hand side, but you know, right or left, it doesn't really matter, but at least try to put it on the top. We also require that the title, and this could just be simply pH benzoate. You don't need the full title, just pH benzoate. That's good enough. The date and the name at the top of each page. So name could just be your last name. Maybe you write that over on the left. And then pH benzoate, and then date it up at the top somewhere, the date that you wrote into the lab notebook, and then put in the page number. All of that has to go into the top of every single page. All right, I know it's a pain, but that's just how lab entries go. Uh, next, a table of contents is also required for a notebook. So that table of contents will be building as we go. So as you're making your entries, that will be a live page where you will go back and you will constantly write into that table of contents. And as we do new labs, you will make new entries onto that table of contents. Okay. You also want to make sure that all the blank areas are crossed out. So if you have an empty page, and if that empty page, let's say, is here, and you're writing and writing, and let's say that I tape in maybe a receipt ticket here, or maybe this is like a folded up whole sheet of paper that has a graph or something on it, I don't know. But as I'm writing into the lab notebook, and let's say that I stop right there, and I have all of this empty space that's down below, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line. And then I'm going to write a big fat X right there at the very bottom of it. And then I'm going to write my initials over it. And this lets people know that this is off limits at this point. Okay, I cannot go back at a later date and add to this page. I cannot go back at a later date and scribble in extra information that I forgot and left out of when we actually did the lab notebook entry. So by forcing you to do that, this page is now off limits. You cannot make any more modifications. You cannot add to the lab. You can't add data. You can't add uh, folded up pieces of paper. You can't add reports or receipt tickets or anything in that particular area once it's crossed. So we like to see those large areas blanked out so that way they cannot be mismanaged later on down the road, okay? And then finally, are mistakes registered? So how do I register mistakes? Well, once again, I'm gonna go up here and clear this off. Let's say that I am writing something into a laboratory notebook, and let's say that I just make a mistake and it sounds stupid, and I don't like the way that I wrote the words. So what I do is I'll draw a line through the word or words that I want deleted, but I do not mark it out. It has to still be uh, someone that has never done the lab should still be able to read that sentence or those phrases or that word and still make out what that was supposed to be beforehand. Okay. And then up here at the very top, I'll draw my initials. So that way people will know who crossed that mistake out. And then most of the time we have to write a reason. I know it sounds crazy, but that's just the way it is. So I would have to maybe come down here below or over here to the side. I don't really care where it's at. And I would have to write a justification. So why did I cross this out? Okay, well, here I could say, well, the wording was strange. That way it would let an auditor know why I did not like that entry. Or if this was a number, maybe I wrote the number backward. Okay, or if this was a calculation, I cross it out and I say I calculated it wrong. Well, if it's something that happens over and over and over to you, some people will develop a code. So what they'll do is that they'll write TH, which is the initials, and they could write one. 
And then in that table of contents on the front part of the lab notebook, well, they could give me a key and they could say, all right, so anytime I write one down, that means that the wording was strange. And this is a common thing that maybe I do all the time. I just get my words backwards kind of dyslexic in a way, right? Okay, so if that's the case, then this is a key that I need to include into the table of contents. So that way I don't have to write this crazy stuff every single time. Okay, if I'm making this mistake like on every page or every other page, who wants to write this every single time that I do it? So let's just develop a code in the very beginning, and it can be anything that you want it to be. It can be numbers, it can be letters, I don't care what it is. As long as it's self-explanatory, that's all that matters, all right? And that will save you a little bit more time and a little bit more work later on as well. And then finally, the conclusion. Did benzoate change into something new? How did you know if it did? What was the unknown based on the density? And what could have went wrong in either procedure? So if something was messed up, how did it get messed up? Could you pinpoint an area that we did that would have really just thrown the data off in the left field and where it didn't make any sense to me at all? Keep in mind that the conclusion, there should be no new information that is included into the conclusion. All of this should be summary. So every piece of data should already be presented. Every kind of tidbit of observation or whatever the case is should have already been entried. The conclusion's purpose is just to sum it all up in a couple of sentences. Again, that's all that you need, a couple of sentences to say, this is what it was and this is what happened and this is what I think could be better next time. That is what the purpose of the conclusion is going to be. So with that said, this is your first grade sheet that you're probably seeing from me. And if so, welcome to the wonderful world of a lab notebook. But what I tried to do is I tried to give you these with every single lab that requires a notebook entry. All right. If I'm still giving you some of those, I mean, no one wants to do this all the time. Right. So I still give you some of those old school fill in the blank, do the calculation types of labs just to break it up a little bit. But there are going to be moments in this semester where you are going to be required to entry all of the things that we are doing together in the lab inside of a notebook. And this will give you the guideline of what you should be writing and how you should be writing it and what you should be including in order to maximize your points. As long as you go and follow the spreadsheet, as long as you're making all of these entries like you're supposed to, then these labs will typically be a very easy A. All right. As long as your calculations are good, as long as you're not messing up percent yields and stuff in the laboratory, if you're doing it on your own, as long as all of that is legit, right, then this should be a very easy A, if not a easy 100 for you every single time. All right, so this grade sheet's now posted up. You know the purpose of the grade sheet at this point. You'll see more of these grade sheets on later labs, later in the semester. Each one will accompany uh, a laboratory notebook entry whenever that comes around. So the grade sheets are going to be your best friend. I know it looks like a lot of work and a lot of writing, but folks, that's the whole purpose of a laboratory notebook entry, right? Gen Chem stuff, they kind of baby you a little bit, and they lie to you and say this is how the real world is, and this is how a real lab operates, and it's further from the truth if I've ever heard it before. It is nothing like a real laboratory or a real company if you decide to go into the field or in the laboratory sciences. This is how it's done, really, in a laboratory notebook, recorded, handwritten, pen, and if it's not handwritten, it's going to be uh, entered in by your fingers through a keyboard into a computerized database system that we like to call Big Brother or LIMS, Laboratory Information Management Systems. So there's always someone looking over your shoulder and folks, the grade sheets just kind of start training you into what to properly write down for that notebook for those requirements. Okay. All right. So good luck with the laboratory notebook entry. Uh, once you get the laboratory notebook entry finished, uh, if you are meeting me in person for labs, uh, which again, if this is virtual and completely online, you do not. So if it's a hybrid course, 
you will turn this in physically and I will grade it. If it's an internet course, then you will scan your entry and you will upload that entry into Blackboard so that way I can download it and view it that way. Uh, so I'll go through the grade sheet, I'll just double check everything that's there and then I'll send you a grade back. So depending on the type of class that you are enrolled in, fully online, you scan it from your home, you upload it in Blackboard and I grade it, or if we are meeting face to face in a hybrid course, then that hybrid section will require you to physically turn in that notebook to me for grade. All right. So good luck. Uh, if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. And uh, welcome to the wonderful world of laboratory entries. Hope you brought some notebooks.